Can you hear me now? All right. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 57. The bulletin says 5, but we forgot to put the 1 to make it 15. Okay. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For the perishable body must be put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must be put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we introduce Rachel. As we said, Ted isn't here, but Rachel is, and we're very thankful and blessed to have her to come bring the word today. So, here's Rachel. That's... Um, since I'm still fairly new here and there are many of you I haven't met, I should probably say a couple words to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Rachel Maxson and um, I have uh, some graduate training in theology. I've taken a little break from that to move back here to Ventura County where uh, both of my parents grew up. And so if you've been around here for a while, you may know uh, the Bachmans. My grandfather Ben Bachman is here with me today. Um, ben and Marjorie were longtime members of First Baptist Church here in Oxnard. My other grandparents, uh, Jim and Willene Maxson, um, were ministering in Ventura at first at um, Bible Fellowship and then Faith Bible Church and then finally also at Oxnard First Baptist. Um, and it is really an honor for me to be back in this area um, and to be at this church and to open the Word of God with you this morning. I thank you for this opportunity. Since Easter, we've been looking together at the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and the transforming power that central truth has. It's uh, central to our faith. It's also central to all of history. Um, and in the last few weeks, in particular, we've been reading in the letter of Ephesians, about how that very same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives here and now uh, to transform us into his followers, to transform enemies into families. Uh, today, I'm taking us on a slight detour from that look at Ephesians because I want to talk about another consequence of Jesus' resurrection for us. And that's the promise that we, too, will experience the same resurrection of the body in the end of days when God redeems all of creation. Christians everywhere declare this promise when we recite the Apostles' Creed, which ends with the declaration, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. But we rarely consider what it means to, to believe in the resurrection of our bodies, what the hope that we profess might actually look like, and what it means for us in the meantime. Part of the problem is that we have been led astray by ideas that trace back not to the Bible, but to the Greek philosopher Plato. Now, don't get me wrong, I was a philosophy major, I love Plato, um, but on this point, he was mistaken. Plato thought that the soul was good, that immaterial ideas were good, and that material reality was bad, and that their great hope is to someday die and escape our bodies and escape the limits of physical life. But this is fundamentally different from the idea taught by Judaism and then by Christianity at the very beginning of our Bible, that God made the earth in all its magnificent diversity, and he called it good, 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 very good. Physical creation is not inherently bad, as Plato thought. 
It has been damaged by sin, but it can and will be redeemed by its creator. Our hope as Christians is not for the immortality of the soul, but for the resurrection of the body. We have an instinct for this truth, I think, even when we buy into what is basically a platonic idea uh, that the soul, rather than the body, being the part of us that really matters. We know, deep down, we know that bodies are important too. Funeral director and poet Thomas Lynch noted the hollow comfort sometimes laid on the grieving by what he calls the just a shell theory. You hear a lot of it from young clergy, he says, old family friends, well-intentioned in-laws, folks who are unsettled by the fresh grief of others. Invariably, some frightened and well-meaning ignoramus is bound to give out with, it's okay, that's not her, it's just a shell. I once saw an Episcopalian deacon nearly decked by the swift slap of a mother of a teenager, dead of leukemia, to whom he tendered this counsel. Don't tell me it's just a shell, the woman said. She's my daughter. This grieving mother was onto something that we can miss when we don't take a broad enough view of our Christian hope. That poor deacon